Hello, hello, hello. You can hear Boo Boo in the background. <clears throat> All right. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started today. We got MCT oil coffee for you guys this morning. Um, today we're going to be reading a paper coming out of the uh, Meta AI, uh, formerly Facebook AI Research, known as FAIR. Um, it looks like a lot of this team was in Paris, France, but kind of the most senior member was out of uh, Tel Aviv in Israel. This paper is about high fidelity neural audio compression, so not something I deal with a ton in uh, the audio world, but curious to see what it uh, has to say. Um, this paper is super recent came out just a, less than a week ago, I think. Uh, and here we have the uh, GitHub repo, which is also itself fresh uh, in codec. Um, yeah, let's get to it. So uh, they introduce a state-of-the-art, real-time, high-fidelity audio codec, right? So audio codecs, Uh, is a device or computer program capable of encoding or decoding a digital data stream that encodes or decodes audio. So basically when you want to send audio over a network, right, the smaller you can make that data, right, the, the more you can compress it, the better. But usually when you compress things, you do what's called lossy compression and you compress it in such a way that when you uncompress it, it will lose some information, it'll get worse. So uh, in this case, what they're doing is they're using a encoder decoder architecture uh, to uh, create a quantized latent space, right? So they're going to take audio, encode it into this latent space, and then decode it from that latent space to get the audio back. And then the little vector in latent space is uh, going to be significantly smaller and thus easier to send from over the network. Uh, quantize here, right, just just means that it's uh, discretized. Uh, vector quantized VAEs were a thing a while back, so I imagine they're doing something similar here. Okay, we simplify and speed up training by using a single multi-scale spectrogram adversary. Okay, single multi-scale spectrogram adversary that efficiently reduces artifacts and produces high-quality samples. Uh, so there's a novel loss balancer mechanism as well to stabilize the training. The weight of a loss now defines the fraction of the overall gradient it should represent, thus decoupling the choice of this hyperparameter from the typical scale of the loss. Hmm. Yeah, so sometimes people do uh, gradient clipping, right, where they take the, the gradient and they limit it to a certain size. It seems like here they're going to use the weight on a specific loss. I don't know exactly what that means. Maybe some of these hyperparameters on, on multi-component losses sometimes have weights in front of them to tune them, and maybe they're using the same hyperparameter to both weigh the different components of the loss function and to uh, clip the gradients. Finally, we study how lightweight transformer models can be used to compress the representation. Okay, so this is even cooler. It's not only is it a kind of encoder decoder uh, with a quantized latent space, but they're using uh, transformer models to do this. Um, 40% faster than real time. Yeah, this is an important part too, is that 
when you're compressing a uh, signal for streaming specifically, you need it to be fast, right? Your compression algorithm can't and decompression algorithm can't be slow because then you can't actually do it in real time, right? It's the whole point of sending less information over a network is that it can get there faster and hopefully you can reduce the latency and you can uh, make it so that a human uh, has the feeling that it's live, right? Where it's like you're recording it and naturally and it feels like it's like instantly appearing, but really it's being compressed sent over uncompressed so every part of that the compression the sending over and the uncompression needs to be fast uh, okay they go through a couple different loss functions uh, perceptual loss functions right so I don't know if there's a good uh, metrics for determining audio quality I'm sure they will present some later here uh, range of bandwidths, different types of sound, uh, approaches superior to baselines across all evaluated settings. Okay, I wonder what uh, they probably... Extensive subjective evaluation, Mushra tests. I wonder if that's something they created for this paper or whether that's something that exists. Multiple stimuli with hidden reference and anchor is a methodology for conducting a codec listening test to evaluate the perceived quality of the output from lossy audio compression algorithms. Okay, so this is a subjective test where you take trained expert listeners who like Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. I would say that the use of trained listeners is actually probably even, they're saying here fewer listeners are needed, but if you're paying someone money to show up at your lab and, and compare the quality of audio, you know, maybe they're, they're going to give you the result that you want and not the actual result. So something interesting there to think about. Okay, recent studies suggest that streaming audio and video have accounted for the majority of internet traffic. Uh, yep. Streaming audio and video account for 82% of internet traffic. I wonder if they include like video games there or whether that's just all Netflix and TikTok and YouTube. Okay, audio compression, blah, blah, blah. Minimizing the bit rate of a sample, minimizing, yeah, so you have this multi-part objective where you wanna make it as uh, small as possible, right? The bit rate, and then also minimizing the distortion. You don't want to garble it up to the point where you can't tell what it is. Uh, codecs, right, carefully engineered, right, the audio codecs and video codecs that we use now are very hand-designed. Uh, decomposing the input with a signal processing transform and trading off the quality. Yeah, so what they're referring to here, actually they'll probably explain it in a later section, but uh, you can take uh, audio signal, decompose audio signal processing. So yeah, you can take this, right, the original audio signal, and then you can decompose it. There's basically equations that you can use to, to decompose it into uh, its parts, right? So this signal up top is really, you can compose it with this larger, uh, lower frequency, higher amplitude signal down here, and higher frequency, smaller amplitude signal here. And uh, you can create what are basically these spectrographs, right, where you decompose the audio signal uh, based on the different frequencies. and 
the way that human hearing works, certain frequencies aren't as important as others. Uh, so if you can break it, if you can break a signal down by its frequencies, sometimes you can kind of choose to uh, compress the frequencies that matter differently than the frequencies that don't matter, and that allows you to get uh, squeeze some juice out of that stone. So this is what a lot of the hard-coded, engineered, kind of current audio codecs do, is they leverage kind of our knowledge of human hearing and our knowledge of signal decomposition in order to uh, quickly and efficiently send audio. Problem arising in lossy neural compression models. Okay, so it does seem like uh, neural networks as train transforms. So this is OG. Like it seems like this guy Morishima was doing it in 1990. That is ancient history. And then some people have tried it more recently. Ripple and Ziggy Dur, 2019, 2021. So. The model has to represent a wide range of signals, such as to not overfit the training set or produce artifact-laden audio outside its comfort zone. Okay. Yeah, you need to have a large and diverse training set, which I think applies to literally all of deep learning. Uh, discriminator networks that serve as perceptual losses. Um, this is the actual network architecture here. The little diagram. We'll look at that in a second. Let's finish here the, the introduction. Um, we limit ourselves to models that are run in real time. Okay. On a single CPU core. Okay. This is actually, this is a flex here. They could have said real time and then they could have had the model run on a 4090 or a T100 or V100 or one of these crazy GPUs, but they did kind of put their money where their mouth is and say, hey, let's see if we can run this on a single CPU core. Right, so this makes me think that I wonder if they were trying to get this for their uh, headsets. Because Meta does hardware now, right? It's not just a social media company. They actually do real, legit hardware. Uh, we use residual vector quantization of the neural encoder floating put output um, van der Oord 2017 I feel like this might actually be the VQVA neural discrete representation learning I don't think that's the VQVA but it's this whole idea of discretizing the latent space chopping it up Accompanying, we posit that designing end to end neural compression is a set of interwined choices among which at least the encoder decoder architecture, the quantization method, and the perceptual loss play key part. Objective evaluations exist and we report scores on them. Yeah, so they do say that there is ways to quantify the loss, but they also uh, used human evaluation for music and speech. They took a bunch of those people that only listened to flack, and they got them to, to complain about these signals. State-of-the-art scores, blah, blah, blah. Uh, different, uh, these are speeds, so they evaluate their model at 1.5 kilobytes per second to 12 kilobytes per second at 24 kilohertz, and then 6 kilobytes per second to 24 kilobytes per second at 48 kilohertz with stereo. Um, so this is, I think this is probably the most intense, right? highest amount of kilobytes, higher frequency, and the stereo. So you have both left and right, which can be different. 
and then probably the easiest one is a 1.5 kilobyte per second or the lowest bit rate I would suppose the lowest the most you need to compress alright so now we go to some related work here on speech and audio synthesis um, yeah good old WaveNet I remember this uh, where you had uh, an RNN this was back before transformers yep you have kind of GAN based approaches Uh, yep, you have adversarial networks that operate at different multi-scale and multi-period. So, right in in GANs, you have a generative network, and then you have a discriminator network. The discriminator tries to uh, tell you if uh, you're giving it a real signal or a generated signal. And then you use that loss to train the generator network. And uh, obviously, for something like an image, you could do it at different sizes, right? You could give the discriminator a small version of the image, a bigger version of the image, and then that'll bias it. Small version of the image, it'll focus more on kind of the composition of the scene, maybe the colors. And then this, the larger version of the image, it'll focus more on the finer details like texture. So there's something similar that you could do here with audio where you could maybe feed it uh, something that's at a bigger time scale, something that's on a smaller time scale, and different discriminator networks. Or the same discriminator network that has multiple inputs uh, will be able to... I wonder if there's like audio texture, you know, if you zoom in far enough. Okay, so low bitrate parametric speech and audio codecs so have been studied. Look at this. You have papers from 1971, 1982, uh, despite some advances. Okay, so then it looks like audio codecs got a little bit better, 85, 96. You start to see the Internet. Uh, current state-of-the-art traditional audio codecs are Opus. Okay. And Enhanced Voice Service EVS. So 2012 and 2015 are kind of your modern audio codecs that aren't based on uh, deep learning. Yep. These methods produce high coding efficiency and support various different... You could probably tune them based on the bit rate, the audio, and all of that stuff. Neural audio codex. Most methods are based on quantizing the latent space before feeding into the decoder. Interesting. LPC net, wave net, there's the VQVAE that we talked about. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Basically, a bunch of people playing with these same ideas. Uh, different types of losses. Different types of quantization. And then discretizing audio. Speech synthesis, speech emotion conversion, blah, blah, blah. So people have been doing stuff with audio for a long time is, is the TLDR here. All right, let's get to this model. So an audio signal of duration D can be represented by a sequence X in the set of negative one to one of CA, the number of audio channels, and T the number of audio samples at a given sample rate, FSR. So 
sample rate is uh, how often your microphone is basically measuring audio, right? So when you have a, a, a signal, right, such as this, right, you have this little audio signal here with a waveform. What is the amount of time between each little point on this waveform, right, as you move? Very high sample rate, you're going to have a very high resolution of this, right? You're going to have a lot of points. Very low sample rate, you're going to have not a lot of points. So that's what that means. Um, the signal itself is going to be normalized from, for example, negative 1 to 1, just so everything looks cleaner and turns out better, right? So maybe the the very top part of this signal will be 1 and negative 1, and uh, the... So that, that kind of just makes it better when you feed it into the neural network. It doesn't come out, doesn't mess with things as much. Um... And then you have your duration D, right? So duration D times the frequency. So uh, sample rate is going to be a frequency. So whatever, 10 times per second. And then if you multiply that by one second, then the units cancel out and you have a total of 10 times. So T is the kind of time dimensionality, how many individual points there are in your waveform. And then CA is the number of audio channels. So... Uh, I think that might be the mono versus stereo. Okay, so you have an encoder network, E. Uh, you have the latent representation, Z. You have a quantization layer, Q, which uh, gives you the compressed representation, ZQ, uh, which is otherwise quantized, I think is the better way to say that. The latent representation Z is already compressed. And then you have your decoder network G. So this is actually very extremely similar to the VQVAE. Uh, reconstructs the time domain signal. So you, know, you reconstruct the actual X, X hat, and then you compare X hat to X. The whole system is trained end to end to minimize the reconstruction loss applied to over both time and frequency, together with a perceptual loss in the form of discriminators. Okay, visual description of the proposed method can be seen in figure one. Let's go ahead and look at that. Okay, so we have our encoder block, we have our decoder block. Uh, these are usually made to basically mirror, so the architecture this way is the opposite of the architecture. It's basically the same architecture. You have the input signal here, uh, the raw audio. This is uh, basically a decomposition here. And that decomposition goes all the way to the end here. I don't know exactly what they're going to do with that, but the raw audio signal is fed into the encoder. Uh, you get the little latent vector Z should be here. And then what comes out of that is the quantized little vector. Uh, I think they called it ZQ. That's what gets put into the decoder. And then the decoder will reconstruct this signal. And then you basically take the actual signal, right, coming up here through this top line. Uh, that's the real signal. And then you have the imaginary or not an imaginary, I would say generated signal. You feed both of those in there into uh, this discriminator that goes at multiple scales. So you have uh, one discriminator maybe is looking at the very fine detail, one is looking at the kind of longer uh, details, longer in time details, and then that's how you get these two losses. Uh, loss discriminator, I would probably say, and then I don't know what LG is, maybe loss generator. Um, here, right, you took the audio signal, you converted it into a spectrograph, and then you take that spectrograph from the real audio signal, and you compare it to the spectrograph from the generated, 
or decoded audio signal and then you have a loss there loss signal uh, and then you compare also just the signals themselves and that's called LT okay we actually have definitions of what these are okay perfect so uh, encoder decoder which is trained with reconstruction LF and LT what there is no LF here LG for the generator and LD for the discriminator so these are the two losses here the residual vector quantization commitment loss LW okay so there's some kind of loss associated with the quantizer We'll figure out what that is later and then a small transformer language model for entropy coding over the quantized units with L L okay so then you have a transformer language model right transformers are very popular now sequence models they're good at kind of sequences so uh, s some kind of signal over time which happens to be perfect for this kind of uh, application and then they're doing some kind of entropy coding over the quantized unit so uh, some loss that tries to reduce the amount of uh, redundant information in that quantized signal reducing the bandwidth even further cool one second I'm gonna go blow my nose real quick All right, and we're back. So let's take a look at this encoder and decoder architecture section here. Uh, the encodic model is a simple streaming convolution-based encoder-decoder architecture. Okay. I assume... So there's... You can do... Uh, when it comes to audio signals, there's people who actually use, like, the CNNs that you would use for... Uh, like an image right like 2d convolutions and then they do 2d convolutions over the spectrograph right because this thing here is an image that's something that i've seen but i think in this case when they say uh convolution they're talking about a 1d convolution yeah so you're just convolving over the actual uh waveform itself which is a 1d signal um Neurofo coders, blah, blah, blah. Okay, we use the same architecture for 24 and 48 kilohertz. Interesting. Uh, C channels and a kernel size of 7. Right? So, oh, the uh, kernel size is basically how how wide the kernel is All right so oh, neural net Let's see if we can get like a cool little image of it and then it'll be easier to explain um, yeah all these images are kind of terrible what do we say convolutional neural net kernel yeah okay here you go so when you're taking this uh, kernel and you're convolving it over an input in this case this is 2d in our case it would be 1d so remember that um, you're gonna have 
a number of these kernels that are all stacked. That is what's called the channel C, right? So if you have here, you have two, so your number of channels will be two. Um, and then here, the uh, size of the kernel is three by three, right? So in our case, the size of the kernel is one by seven or seven by one and it has C channels. Okay, uh, it's composed of a single residual unit followed by a downsampling layer consisting of a strided convolution. So strided just uh, basically means that it's not going, it's not convolving at every single step, right? So if the each key is like that, it's not moving like that, it's like skipping a couple every every stride. Uh, kernel size of twice the stride. Boo, what do you want? You can hear the little cat screaming. Residual unit contains two convolutions and a skip connection. Okay, so... I remember when these were all the rage, right? You can skip from one layer, a deeper layer in a neural net to a more shallow layer and it just helps your gradients, it kind of connects all the stuff, it's, it's pretty cool. Convolutional blocks are followed by a two layer LSTM mm, long short term memory, this is kind of an older form of sequence modeling I feel like transformers would have been the more ambitious approach here. Do everything with transformers, right? Like, why do you have convolutions and LSTMs? I feel like they would have been better off just using, trying to do the entire thing with transformers. Okay, 32 channels, right? Here they're telling you the number of channels, and then B is the number of conf blocks with, uh, these are the strides, 2, 4, 5, and 8. LU as a nonlinear activation function, and then they have uh, layer norm and and uh, I guess not batch norm, but just normal normal norm. Uh, low latency, high fidelity, right? There's different seventy-five latent steps per second. each convolution for a total padding of k minus s, so padding, uh, damn, I'm just terrible at clicking is what I'm learning. Uh, so padding is whenever you put information before and after a signal in order for the convolution to uh, have something to, to kind of Right, you have a, some signal and the convolution, you don't want it to just start at the beginning and then end once the tail, right? So you, you add extra padding so that the convolution can go over that beginning point and then it can go past the end point it, if it needs to. Right, and the, the padding is going to be a function of kind of your kernel size and then also the uh, stride that you're using. Yep, they split the input into one second chunks and then normalize each chunk before feeding it. And then apply the inverse operation on the output of the decoder. Yeah, so normalization is, they're probably referring to here, the uh, normalizing the amplitude on the waveform so that it's negative one to one. And then every one second they normalize it and whatever the highest spike is in that one second, right, that'll kind of define uh, the normalization for that entire second. Which is interesting because it's, I wonder if they they looked at uh, kind of high dynamic range audio, right, audio where you have things that are very quiet and things that are very loud and how that might affect kind of the normalization of this. OK, 
gate. Blah, blah, blah. Stride S. They're doing some stuff with memory here. Okay, cool. Slightly different formalization depending on whether they're going in streaming like a higher quality mode, one where quality is important, and then a different mode where uh, speed is the most important. They use residual vector quantization. Vector quantization consists in projecting an input vector to into the onto the closest entry in a code book, right? The closest entry in a code book. Uh, computing the residual after quantization and further quantizing using a second code book. Interesting. Okay, so code book is basically you could think of it just like a collection of uh, points in this uh, embedding space, right? And these points correspond to basically you're building over time this set of points and rather than for example if you have a point that's uh, here and a point and you and you and your uh, encoder gives you a vector that points to a point in the latent space that's here then the residual vector quantization is going to say, hey, move to here because we have another vector that's really close to that in our code book and that becomes the vector that you use. It's kind of a terrible explanation. But follow the training procedure. Yep, the code book entry is updated using an exponential moving average so that you update the uh, code books or the words in the code book as I don't know if word is the right thing, but you, you update the quantized vectors in the codebook over time. And by the end of the training, you have a codebook with a bunch of vectors that have some kind of semantic meaning to whenever you decode them, right? Compute the gradient of the encoder as if the quantization step was the identity function during the backward phase. Okay. A commitment loss consisting of the MSC between the input of the quantizer and its output. Okay, so input of the quantizer and its output. So the quantizer is going to take that latent vector z and then quantize it, turn it into a different vector zq, where that different vector zq is comes out of the code book. But you want to have a loss that prevents that uh, latent vector z and that latent vector and that quantized latent vector zq from being too different, right? If they're too different then you're kind of losing information there. And this is something that happens in these uh, latent spaces where they just kind of compress. They, they collapse is a better word. And then, right, if you just have one point in your code book that's always the same for all things, that's actually going to be good for your loss sometimes. So like you have this loss that says, hey, make sure that the stuff that comes out of this quantizer, quantize, quantization, uh, process is not too dissimilar from what's actually coming out of the uh, encoder. Okay, so Okay, so they have 32 code books with 1024 entries each. They have a continuous latent representation uh, with the shape is B, D, and T. Uh, so I'm assuming that's uh, what did we say B was? 
Damn, we don't even know what B is. B is the number of convolution blocks. Uh, D is likely uh, this D, duration D, so total number of seconds. And then T is, I guess, total number of time steps. This procedure turns it into a discrete set of indices B and Q T, with NQ being the number of codebooks selected. This discrete representation can change again to a vector by summing the corresponding codebook entries. Uh, okay, so the output, the codebook isn't actually storing full quantized vectors, it's storing little pieces of them. And then you can convert the discrete representation back to the latent vector that has the actual semantic meaning by summing up the individual little components that each codebook gives you. So it's, it's kind of like a piecewise thing, right? The codebook is storing a bunch of little pieces and then you can build these vectors in the latent representation space by summing these little pieces. Okay, that's kind of cool. Language modeling and entropy coding. We additionally train a small transformer-based language model. Vaswami getting even more citations with the objective of keeping faster than real time end-to-end -end compression and decompression on a single CPU core. Five layers, eight heads, 200 channels, dimension of 800 for the feed-forward blocks, and no dropout. Okay, so it's kind of a small transformer because, of course, it needs to kind of run pretty quickly uh, on a CPU. Time step T. Okay. A special token is used. Okay, so there's like a kind of start sequence token and sequence token, which you can see in, in these language problems a lot. Giving the logits of the estimated distribution over each codebook for time t. We thus neglect mutual information between the codebooks. This allows us to speed up inference. Okay, so each attention layer, so each head on that transformer. Uh, Right. If you if you kind of go down the the network stack, right, there's convolution happening and you can say you can actually calculate how much how what the receptive field is of that, right? Like how much of the signal does uh each attention head in this actually have access to and it's three point five seconds, which is interesting because it's more it's that's almost four times the one second normalization. We offset by a random amount in the initial position of the sinusoidal to emulate being a longer sequence. We train the model in sequences of five seconds. MSSTFT. I think that's Mel Spectrum something frequency transforms. MSFTFTD. MSFTFTD. STFT. MSSTFT. This is not Microsoft stock. That's not what they're talking about. I think it's like. Mel frequency or whatever. I'm not 100% sure. Complex valued STFT with real and imaginary parts concatenated. Okay, each discriminator is composed of a 2D convolutional layer followed by 2D convolutions with increasing dilation rates. 
Okay, so this is the discriminator network that receives both of the uh, both the real signal and then the fake signal, or not the fake, but the encoded and then decoded signal. And right, you're feeding both of these, and then you're comparing them with 2D comms because they're spectrograph images. Between batch and real time occurs in the decoder can lead to a difference larger than 10. Okay, interesting. So they're saying that there, there's kind of issues with a floating point rounding. Okay, and now this kind of is just uh, the different losses that they have. So I think it might be easier if we just uh, use this image here. Wow, that is uh, open image in a new tab. There we go. That's what we want. Okay, so the reconstruction loss, LF. There is no LF. Like, they just made that up. I think they might have mislabeled it. I think it should be the... Uh, I don't know, why is it not on this picture? It's comprised of a time and frequency domain loss term. We minimize the L1 distance between the target and compressed audio over the time domain. So maybe it's this one here, LT, right? This is just looking at the uh, raw signal. And I think this symbol here, these two pipelines are the L1 loss symbol, so this, right? Although in, in here, this is actually an L2 loss. So when you see that little two there, that means L2 loss. Right, so you're just taking the original audio and then the encoded decoded audio x hat subtracting them uh, and then here they use a linear combination between the two losses so they have an L2 loss here they have an L1 loss here uh, and then they have a weighted combination of them uh, the MEL spectrogram, that's what I keep calling a spectrograph, it's this thing here. This uh, yellow and blue image. Okay, it's a 64 bin MEL spectrogram, so spectrograms, they're decomposing it based on frequency, so 64 bins just means that there's 64 uh, frequency bins in the y-axis here. So there's going to be 64 possible different lines. And then the x-axis on this image is going to be uh, time. Okay. Window sized. Okay, this is a Fourier transform. To further improve the quality, we introduce a perceptual loss based on a multi scale STFT, STFT signal processing. Short time Fourier transform, yeah. So MSSTFT is MEL spectrogram short time Fourier transform. Um, 
multi-scale STFT Uh, identically up multi-scale with real and imaginary parts concatenated. Each sub is composed of a 2D convolutional layer followed by 2D convolutions with increasing dilation rates. Yep. Uh, dilation is a uh, kind of dilated convolution. Yeah, so here you go. This is a dilated. This is a good picture. Uh, dilated convolution spreads the kernel, so it doesn't interact at the same resolution as the input. Right. So in our case, since we're doing one D convolutions in time, right, rather than looking at every single sample, it'll look at maybe every other sample or every third sample or something like that. Uh, in this case, one, two, and four over the frequency axis. Okay, so in this case it's not the 1D, it's the 2D convolutions that are being dilated and they're being dilated over the frequency axis which is this uh, Y axis here up and down on this MEL uh, spectrogram image. A final 2D convolution with a kernel size of 3.3 and a strata 1.1 provides the final prediction. Okay. Uh, five different scales of STFT. So this is the uh, X dimension, I think. So this way. Right, from here to here. For 48 kilohertz audio, right, you're going to have twice as many samples, double the size of each window. Uh, for stereo, uh, we process separately the right and left. They use leaky ReLU as a nonlinear activation. So leaky ReLU is like a ReLU, but... Um, it leaks, right? So ReLU is composed of two parts. You have this kind of flat part here. So if the input is negative, the output is going to be zero. If the input is really, really, really negative, the output is still going to be zero. So the way that leaky ReLU is different is that uh, if you have a positive signal, it's just going to be whatever proportional to the size of that positive signal, like ReLU. But when you have negative signal, if it's super negative, now it's actually going to be a little bit negative, right? And that allows uh, gradients to kind of flow a little bit better. So you're not kind of zeroing out these negative gradients completely. You're, you're, if they're very large, right? If there's a very large negative signal going backwards, then it'll, or large negative signal, it'll just prop, it'll, it'll uh, keep going a little bit more. Fuck, dude. Every time. I'm just like, I can't help myself. I just always accidentally click on these. Uh, weight normalization. Okay. Adversarial loss for the generator. So, um, I think that's this one here. LD and then LG. The discriminator and the generator losses. Okay, K is the number of discriminators, so you're going to have a, a, a bunch of these, and you're going to sum uh, over all the discriminators and then divide. So it's like an average there. Similar to previous work on neural vocoders, we additionally include a relative feature matching loss for the generator. DK are the discriminators. Okay, so you're feeding the signal. This is the original audio signal X. This is the decoded audio signal X, or encoded and then decoded. Then you're feeding them into your discriminator, right? Uh, your discriminator, the difference between those, right? The discriminator here, DK, right? This signal here. It's going to output 
uh, different num different two different uh, vectors, if you want to call it that, based on the audio input. Uh, if x is very different from x hat, this is going to be a big number. If x is the same as x hat, this is going to be a very small number. Uh, then you're dividing by the mean of that. I suppose it's just to normalize, right? Because if you have uh, a signal that that has a lot of, it's right, it's like all at this height versus a signal that's very quiet, you don't want that to impact your loss. And then you sum over uh, L, which is the number of layers, and uh, K, which is the number of discriminators. And that's your L feet. Minimize the following hinge loss adversarial loss function. LD. Given that the discriminator tends to overpower easily, we update its weight with a probability two thirds. Yeah, so this sometimes happens where GANs are notorious for this, where the training is difficult. Um, and right, you're trying to train this generator and this discriminator uh, at the same time. And a lot of times the discriminator gets good before the generator gets good and then the training kind of falls apart, right? Maybe the latent space collapses or something like that. So in this case, they do something that you can almost think of it as dropout, right? Where rather than knocking out an individual neuron randomly, you just don't uh, update the weights on the discriminator randomly. So 30% of the time you don't do it. All right, multi-bandwidth training. We train the model to support bandwidths. Okay, so selecting the number of appropriate cookbooks. Dedicated discriminator per bandwidth. Okay, so they have different, so bandwidth, right? If you have a very small bandwidth, 1.5 kilobytes per second, you're going to have lossy signal. You're, you're going to have to be a little bit more draconian about how much you, you compress the signal versus if you have more bandwidth, you can try to squeeze out as much quality as possible. So in this case, they have different discriminators, right? So the discriminator at a 1.5 bandwidth is just kind of squinting and being like, yeah, it seems fine, versus the discriminator at 24 kilobytes per second is much more of a stickler me seeks. VQ commitment loss, vector quantization commitment loss. Okay, so this is the loss that they were talking about earlier where you... Uh, are trying to gauge the uh, entropy of the quantization process and then just try to make that as efficient as possible, right? For each residual step, noting ZC, And the nearest entry to this corresponding codebook, okay. Here you have, uh, yeah, the final loss is, uh, Right, all these different losses that we've been looking at, but now uh, weighted by a bunch of hyperparameters here that normally you're going to have to tune. So first you kind of use your human intuition to get a good guess, and then you tune them over time.
Um, to reduce the loss balancer in order to stabilize training, in particular the varying scale of the gradients coming. Yeah. I have to take a picture of this boo is attacking my screen. Boo, look at the screen. Look at it. Okay. Exponential moving average over the training batches. Okay, so they're basically using an exponential moving average of the gradients as opposed to the gradients themselves. I don't know exactly what this does. I'm still trying to get a picture of my cat <laughs> going on the mouse, sorry. Here, maybe you guys can see that. There she is. Little Boo, the namesake of this channel. And now all my work to get this centered is gone. All right, back to it. Let's let's get to it. Okay, whatever. They're doing some kind of tricky stuff with the gradients because they have a bunch of different discriminators and generators. Okay. They have a couple different, uh, there's a lot of different types of audio, so right, they basically are making sure that they're, uh, oh, look at this, someone said something. Thanks. Let me know what papers or projects you want me to review in the comments. Okay. Sorry, I feel like I'm getting sick. My like brain is just like foggy. Okay, so Mushra, this was like kind of the expert human uh, evaluation stuff that we were looking at before, uh, and then in codec. So in codec is the this paper, and then Opus is Opus and EVS are like the. This was the the hard coded like current state of the art encoder. So Mushra higher is better, I suppose. So a, a high Mushra score means that the expert humans said that it was pretty good quality. So obviously at a very low bit rate, the quality is always going to be worse, right? Because you have such a limited budget to fit all that information and at a higher bit rate, you're going to be competing more. 
So, I mean, this is pretty huge, right? You have at a bit rate of six, the current state of the art, uh, Lyra is getting a score of 60 from the human experts. But you can achieve that same score of 60 at a bit rate of 1.5 uh, using this neural network method. So that seems impressive, but again, it really depends on kind of what Mushra means, right? Are these people getting paid to to give favorable reviews or give favorable things, or are they is this like kind of like a double blind situation where they don't know what they're listening to? Okay, they have some kind of a couple different data sets here: DNS Challenge Four audio set, FD FSD fifty K. Hamendo data set. These are all relatively recent too. 2022, 2019, 2021, etc. For training and validation, we define a mixing strategy which consists... Okay. Okay, so there's some kind of mixing strategy. Okay, so they, I guess they take a couple different audio sources and just kind of put them on top of each other. And then I guess if you have a speech data set and then you have a music data set, you can put the music on top of the, or you can put the speech on top of the music, and it's kind of like if you have someone talking with music in the background, and maybe that's a way of kind of synthetically creating audio data. It's interesting. Clean speech, speech mixed with uh, music, and blah, 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 okay. Okay, so the baseline here that they're using is the Opus. It goes from 6 kilobytes to s per second uh, for mono audio to 510 kilobytes per second for stereo audio. EVS is another one. Uh, voice over LTE, so that's probably what you're using in your cell phones. This one is actually for smaller bandwidths, or smaller uh, bit rates, and then these are the bandwidths. Finally, we compare Encodec to the Soundstream, Lyra. They implement a version of Soundstream themselves with minor improvements. Okay. This is the Mushra scores uh, for Encodec. I wish they would have bolded this and told us uh, which one is high, or higher is better. Okay, so for example, in music, uh, interesting, the audio quality itself of the original, like when the humans listen to it, they're saying it's not even 100%. So. Yeah, you kind of see a big difference here. In Kodak, all these numbers tend to be higher, right? Let's compare the 12 kilobytes per second, right? Opus at 12 kilobytes per second is 77 for music. In Kodak is 91. Uh, noisy speech, you have 61 for Opus at 12 kilobytes per second and 80 for in Kodak, also at 12 kilobytes per second. And if you look at kind of a lower bit rate, the six kilobytes per second, uh, noisy speech, Opus, terrible score here, 19, and in Kodak at six kilobytes per second, you have 69, significantly higher. Okay. Uh, consider both subjective and evalu objective evaluation metrics. Uh, Mushra, both a hidden reference and a low anchor. Okay, this is the double blind. Is it double blind?
Oh, okay, objective metrics, they have some kind of scale invariant signal to noise ratio. This is probably a misspelling, it should just be ratio, and then whatever the fuck this is, V-I-S-Q-O-L. Okay, 300 epochs of 2,000 steps. Uh, atom optimizer, batch size is 64. Uh, each in, each up each uh, instance each data point is one second. Uh, very small. Very small learning rate. Um, this is the op, uh, atom optimizer parameters for the momentum. Uh, eight A one hundred GPUs. So we can look at that A one hundred GPUs. High-end GPUs, A100. Can we look at... Uh, what does it cost to get an A100? A100, $23,000 for this GPU. Or $15,000. So, this is huge, man. Like, eight A100s is over a hundred thousand dollars of GPUs which is quite crazy but again this is a meta paper so I guess you that's why that's why they get to do the cool stuff is because they got all the money uh, compare them Gumball softmax uh, other quantizers all right other ways of quantizing that latent vector Better performance. Okay. Compression ratio changes. Streamable versus non streamable evaluations. Okay, so these are different discriminators. So are you just looking at the MEL spectrogram short-term Fourier transform, which is the image, uh, the mono version of that image? We see that the the best scores, there isn't a ton of difference between these, but the best scores are achieved with uh, everything. So the image and the MPD, I don't know what MPD is, I think it's just the signal itself. Okay, actually, here you go. This is the ablation study that they're looking at there. Multi-scale discriminator. Okay, so uh, right. So you have the multi-scale, multiple discriminators. You have one that's operating at the finer time resolutions, others that are operating at higher time resolutions. Uh, you also have a multi-period discriminator, which reshapes the waveform into a 2D input with multiple periods. Okay. Uh, you have the SFT, STFD, the Fourier transform, or the mono version of that. Uh, and then they're comparing all of those, and it, basically the one that does best is the this one. MS, STFT, and MPD. Okay, so they actually say that most of the... using only a multi-scale STFT is enough to generate high-quality audio. So you don't need this additional multi-period discriminator which saves you uh, on final compute time because it's just easier to do. Mm. Okay. Yep. They have to tune these parameters. 
And then here they talk about stereo evaluation, so evaluating this on stereo. It's a variable gain between 20% and 30%. Real-time factor. What is that? So I'm guessing real-time factor is some kind of measure of this total speed. So it's like kind of like a some kind of metric similar to latency. I wish I could know if this real-time factor is ratio. Okay, here it is. Real-time factor is defined as the ratio between the duration of the audio and the processing time. So it is greater than one when the method is faster than real-time. Okay. So if it's greater than one, it's faster than real-time, right? You're spending uh, the processing time is less than the duration of the audio. Um, right, so the only times it's not real time where it takes more time to process the audio than the duration of the audio itself is when you have a 48 kilohertz sample rate. Um, And this is the entropy coding, so this is the transformer part of the quantization. Yeah, so that actually takes a bunch of time. Look how much this impacts it by, right? Like, look over here, just encoder, decoder, very fast. 6.8, 5.1. Encoder, decoder, but now you add that entropy coding significantly slower. Um, this is the actual CPU that they're using, MacBook Pro. Uh, using entropy encoding increases the latency because the stream cannot be flushed in order to keep the overhead small. Okay. Using accelerated hardware, yeah, this is what I thought they were going to do when I first started reading this paper, is they were just going to run this on super expensive computers. Not that they didn't already do that for training, though. State-of-the-art real-time neural audio, producing high-fidelity audio. Uh... Oh, stabilized training, small transformer model can be used to further reduce bandwidth without degradation of quality. Yeah, but it adds much of time, so where low latency is not essential, so that's kind of the problem, is that this fancy transformer entropy coding stuff, it, like, just brutalizes the total amount of processing time so it's not possible if you want speed um cool that's the paper here we have a bunch of appendices um let's go ahead and look at this code base so insights Contributors. I always like looking at the uh, contributor graph. It kind of gives me a pretty good idea of what's going on here. So, really, this is all just one guy, Adi Fosses, who I think is likely to be the first author here. Yep, Alexandra D. Fosses. Uh, why don't we go ahead and give this guy a follow here? This guy does a bunch of stuff for Facebook Researcher, a bunch of audio stuff. 
Um, he started contributing kind of October 16th, and he's been ramping up since then. Um, bunch of commits as early as yesterday. Uh, MIT license. Non-commercial license, so don't use this for your startup. Okay. Samples are provided on our sample page. I don't have OBS hooked up, so like unfortunately you can't hear that. Um, I should figure out how to do that, but you can go to this page and, and listen to these yourself. Uh, Python 3.8, uh, PyTorch. Okay, we can actually look at the setup.py, see what... Uh, See what dependencies this has. Install requires, so NumPy, Torch, Torch Audio, that was EinOps. New flavors of deep learning operations. Okay, so it's a way of kind of like shuffling images somehow. Transposing and shuffling images and rearranging tensors. Okay. Be curious to see where that gets used. Um, we can actually probably go here. Uh, search in this repo. Hmm. Model storage. Torch hub. Pre-trained model repository. All right, cool. So they're putting them there, but if it's a non-commercial license, that's quite sinister, you know, it's like putting a non-commercial license model on the PyTorch hub, you're kind of just asking for people to accidentally use it in their business and then they can get sued for that. Decompression, compression. Okay, Torch Audio. Uh, initialize the model here, set a target bandwidth, load a piece of audio, uh, this is the sample rate, this is the uh, actual waveform, unsqueeze so you get rid of the batch dimension, or you add a batch dimension of zero at the zeroth, right, so like rather than having a single waveform you now have a batch of waveforms although in this case there's just one. Uh, convert audio codec, so I'm assuming that this sample rate channel wave, I don't exactly know what this encodec utils uh, convert audio does, but you still have that waveform you ask the model to encode that waveform, you get the encoded vector quantized. Okay, this is the actual thing you could send over, I suppose. Cool. Uh. All right, so my brain is pretty fried, guys. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and take a nap or something. Um, but yeah, here we go. This was high fidelity neural audio compression uh, by the F Meta AI, formerly Facebook AI research team, uh, mostly out of Paris, France, and this is mostly work by Alexandre Defossé.
Cool. Check it out if you guys think it's cool. Uh, if not, see you tomorrow. Thank you.